Time for Kilkenny. It is going to be one of the most fiercely contested debates, I dare say, in the country. The Mount Rushmore of Kilkenny, four sports people and only four can make it. We've got Enda McAvoy and we've got Gary Halpin. Lads, you're very welcome. How are you getting on? Morning. Good morning. Getting on well, thank you. Good stuff. Enda, we may as well uh, start with you. Uh, this is quite the pressure that's bestowed on your shoulders. I'm not sure if you heard Tommy, well Tommy Welch earlier on talking about the unbelievable list of hurling candidates that are up there. But it's not just about hurling this Mount Rushmore, is it? No, no, it certainly isn't. And uh, that's a point that probably doesn't come across uh, often enough because Kilkenny in recent years has become so identified with hurling, we tend to forget, or people outside tend not to realise just the breadth of sporting talent there has been down the years in the county. Uh, a few names uh, I want to throw at you because I think it's important that people know about them and what they've done. Uh, one very obvious one is Mick Dowling, uh, the Irish international boxer uh, who became a really, really good boxing analyst on TV with RT every Olympics. Mick Dowling, I think, won eight national bantamweight titles in a row back in the day. Fantastic boxer from Homer. Went to two Olympic Games, 68, and in 1972 in Munich was one fight away from a medal, uh, which would have been fantastic. Mm. Uh, talking of Olympic medals and um, one guy who might be up in the Kilkenny Mount Rushmore in years to come is Arthur Lannigan O'Keefe mm. the modern pentathlon guy uh, obviously no Olympic Games this year but Arthur Lannigan O'Keefe from Thomastown has been to two Olympic Games before and back in February in Cairo at the World Pentathlon Championship he came third so he will be a live contender when mm. the Olympic uh, many contender when the Olympics uh, do go ahead. Um, we ha uh, we have Ian Dowling, uh, Gary, um, I want mm. to talk about Ian Dowling in time. In time. Ian Dowling uh, from Kilkenny City, Castlecomer Road, two Heineken Cups with Monster. Uh, way back in the day, there was a lady called Maeve Kyle, a remarkable athlete that very few people in Kilkenny under a certain age have even heard of anymore. Maeve Kyle was formerly Maeve Shanky. Uh, she was from John Street in Kilkenny. Her father came to town a hundred years ago, a hundred and ten years ago actually, to build uh, John's Bridge, the, the new, the current John's Bridge in Kilkenny. C.G. Shanky ended up as a principal headmaster in Kilkenny College later on for many years. Maeve Shanky, later Maeve Kyle, was his daughter, played hockey for Ireland, then went to the Olympic Games in Melbourne in 1956 as Ireland's first ever female track and field uh, athlete at right. the Olympics. Also went to Rome and Tokyo. A remarkable woman, and she's still alive up in Ballymena. So um, uh, actually, can I keep going? with a couple of other names here. We, uh, well, we, we, may, we, may as well, we may as well get into them in, in just a moment because you're setting the scene sure. beautifully here, uh, Enda, because what we've got is this uh, array of unbelievable non-hurlers at the moment. Uh, and I'm not sure, Nathan, about the, the conversation earlier on that we had with Tommy Walsh. Did, did we manage to, to put a hurler up on the pedestal that will uh, allow the lads to sift through? It seems to me that this is still very much all open, Nathan. Uh, no, I, I think uh, listening to Tommy, he had his shortlist, I think, initially of six and then added JJ Delaney into it as well and wasn't really willing to commit to any of them. I, you know, obviously put it that I just can't see how you can have a Mount Rushmore without Cody. Uh, but then, as Tommy pointed out, well, if you start comparing one with the other, what are you trying to use to separate them? And I guess that's where it comes down to personal opinion. My feeling throughout this, since we did the Mayo one in week one, is that the sort of mythical side of it is a, is a big thing that maybe DJ has that mm. elevates him right up there. But like trying to pick, it's it's brilliant to listen to Enda talk about the non-hurling because I think most people will go and probably tuning in are thinking, well, it's Kilkenny, it's going to be four hurlers. But you talk about the talent that's there. I think a couple of those most certainly deserve to push themselves into contention. Well, Andy, we may as well let you go through the rest of the list of non-hurling contenders. Gary, we'll bring you in then to, to kind of give your sense of how you're selecting this, uh, and then we may as well get into the first pick. So uh, uh, away you go, Enda. All right. <laughs> I started, so I'll finish, etc., uh, etc. Et um, uh, right. Um, Richie Maloney uh, from outside Kilkenny City. 
showdown for uh, Aga Khan Cup winner in Kilkenny. Sorry, with Ireland, what am I saying? Uh, won the Nations Cup in the RTS with Ireland uh, a few years back. He's on the show jumping circuit in Florida. Richie Maloney doing very well out there for himself. Uh, back in the day, really back in the day, you had a Kilkenny woman from Valley Ragged called Mabel Cahill uh, who ended up winning five US Open tennis titles in the 1890s. Uh, no one knows about her. I knew, I knew nothing about her uh, until very recently. But uh, obviously a great story there. Uh, long before Duxy Welsh, uh, the previous great Irish handballer was John Joe Gilmartin from Kilkenny back in the 40s. He, uh, 40s and 50s, he won 24 uh, All-Ireland handball titles. Um, you uh, have Paul Hensey, Graham Trainer, two uh, uh, English Greyhound Derby winners. Back in the day, you had pa Paddy Dunphy from Castle Comer, won the 1962 English Greyhound Derby, what they don't call the Grand Canal. Uh, you Okay, uh, at the moment, of course, you have Willie Mullins, mm -hmm. the master of Cheltenham, absolute genius. Before him, you had his father, Paddy, John Rohn. Do we need to say anything more than that? Yeah. Uh, the only horse to win the Champion Hurdle and Cheltenham Gold Cup. Uh, one rugby guy, uh, I'm sure Gary uh, will mention him, uh, really needs to be mentioned, is Ned Bourne. Ned Bourne won an All-Ireland Hurling medal with Kilkenny and then went on and won three Irish rugby caps mm. in the front row. An amazing achievement. Uh, nobody has ever won an All-Ireland medal football or hurling on the field of play and gone on to uh, be capped by Ireland rugby. Uh, and I think, I think we've actually got a, a, a bit of a, a, a thumbs up there for, from Gary on the, the other line. What, the, the, the rugby contenders, Gary, uh, yeah. when it comes to that, I, I'm sure Enda's making a few strong cases here, but but on rugby in particular, what, what piques your interest? Yeah, the, the, the main rugby contender for me has to be Willie Duggan because uh, Willie was yeah, probably more than arguably the best number eight in the world at the end of the 70s, and he was in some fantastic company there with Mervyn Davis, the, the, the Welsh number eight, and Murray Megstead. I suppose back then you didn't have a system where you, you know, where you had definitive, uh, de you know, decisions made about who was the bona fide best. But in '77, the New Zealand rugby writers came together to vote Duggan, the the player of the '77 mm -hmm. Lions tour. And I suppose if you were looking for a best yardstick at the time, that for me would stand as, you know, concrete evidence that this guy was <clears throat> truly a, a world leader in his position in the game. Um, so that's that's why Duggan is actually number one on my list. And obviously, right. being an ex-rugby player, you would see why I would support that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, between Tommy earlier on, uh, between uh, all these different contenders here, I think we've got a decent enough picture now of who the contenders mm -hmm. are across all a variation of sports in Kilkenny. Uh, and I know that there's pr probably uh, countless more people you could mention, but unfortunately we're going to have to get straight into pick number one here. So how this works if you're joining us for the first time in Mount Rushmore is uh, Enda McAvoy is our OTB selector. He is going to pick four names and then Gary will come in and he will be able to make one change to your mountain. So that's how it works. So uh, Enda, your first pick on your Kilkenny Mount Rushmore, please. Uh, my first pick is Andrew Downey, camogie okay. player, the greatest camogie player of all time. Um, there isn't even an argument about that. I mean, you have Messi or Maradona, you have Sheffield or Ring. Uh, it's in camogie, which, remember, is a mass participation sport. And I would like to get uh, Anne Downey in as well, if I could, her sister. Also 12 or medals, but uh, Andrew Downey uh, is my uh, first pick on the Kilkenny Sporting Mount Rushmore. Did she come into your contention, Gary, or into your consideration? Uh, she was up there. Uh, I had considered her, but she didn't come into uh, my four. Um, I, I, the, 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 my, the, the, the people, um, do you want to go, do you want me to go through my four now? Sorry. Well, it, it, we we're just going to talk about Angela Downey here, and in terms of those camogie players uh, who you might have considered, or, or who might have come close while, while we kind of get through why she's such a good candidate. Well, uh, uh, as Enda's saying, she's winner of multiple, multiple All-Irelands, uh, and she has been an, an outstanding athlete in camogie mm. for Ireland over the years. 
And uh, I would absolutely concur with that. In terms of Camogie, for me, she is that standout sort of Maradona name in Kilkenny more than anybody else, I would say. So I would fully agree. Yeah, you know, I would agree with that selection that Enda has made. Uh, what type of player was she, Enda? A forward, just a fantastic forward, goal after goal after goal, uh, absolutely ruthless in front of goal, medal after medal after medal. Um, look, there, I don't think there's anything more to say about her than that. She was just fantastic. Uh, I have never seen anybody uh, disagree with the contention. She was the Camogie's greatest player ever. I don't think there's any argument about that. Who's your second pick, and that? Uh, my second pick, uh, right, um, my second pick, Henry Shefflin. Uh, again, probably no need to go into the details. Obviously, most uh, be medals, hurler ever, 10 Ireland medals, a million All-Stars, I think it's 11 All-Stars. A uh, couple, couple of interesting things about Shefflin is that he scored a goal, uh, at least one goal, in 14 championships in a row. That's some going. And also, he played, until he got injured in 2013, he played 62 successive championship matches for Kilkenny. Then he missed out uh, on a couple in 2013. He broke the spell. Uh, it was snapped. But 62 consecutive uh, championship appearances for a centre forward or full forward uh, in this day and age uh, just shows how consistently good he was. And again, you can argue, obviously, Ring or Shefflin or whatever, but uh, no question about it. Uh, Shefflin, the supreme horror of the modern era, one of the greatest horrors Kilkenny has ever produced. Uh, so he has to be up there. Is Henry Shefflin on your list, Gary? No, Henry Shefflin wasn't on my list. And funny enough, how I came up with my list, I, I, I have hummed and hawed about this, but my initial four people were Willie Duggan, Willie Mullins, Maeve Kyle and, and Duxy Welsh. And um, I used the criteria for doing that. And then I said, you just can't have a list without hurdlers. I, I said to myself, and I, I didn't know, and I, I was hating over it for the longest of longest of times. Um, you'd almost need a, a separate competition just for Kilkenny hurlers. And one of the difficulties I have, and I've been a great uh, fan of hurling for many years, but it's just singling one person out to give one person an award is very, is very difficult because even in the most recent years, going back, say, 10 years or so, you, you know, you've characters like DJ Carey, TJ Reid, Shefflin, Jackie Turl, and Richie Hogan. Now, if I had to had to go for somebody, mm. DJ Carey is the guy who I would go to because, um, you know, having, as I say, watching hurling as a kid, I, I recognise things in DJ Carey that, you know, I, I saw him. This guy, I've always felt, could have been brilliant in a number of sports. What made him remarkably good to me was his ability to move, to take passes, and just his footwork, the way he carried himself away from defenders, he was just, he was excellent. And he was one of those, uh, Ender called them a, a Maradona or a Messi character, so many times when we really needed a score, this was the guy who did it. And you could, you know, you, you could put your mortgage on the guy. And that's, uh, and that's why I would say, if I had to pick a Kilkenny hurler, DJ Carey would be the guy who I'd put on my list. And that's a Sheriff Shefflin in any way, shape, or form. Sure. And it's such a hard decision to make. I think, Owen, it was great to hear from Tommy Welch yesterday or earlier today, uh, somebody who was in the dressing room, because quite often when we start these conversations, you do have the conversation of, well, how do you separate JJ and Jackie and Tommy Welch and Richie Power and Owen Larkin and Eddie Brady and DJ and Henry Shefflin? But much like Tyrone last week when we had a similar conversation about their great footballers, Enda McGinley was able to go, well, actually, within that dressing room, there were great players. But Brian Duher and Peter Canavan were at a different level. And likewise, Tommy Welch there was able to say, well, there were a lot of great players there. But J.J. Delaney, as a defender, and Henry Shefflin were at a different level. They were at that genius level, which is probably why, I think, of all those players, Henry, of the modern era, is the one who would most, be most likely to feature on most people's Mount Rushmore. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting point, and it's very, very hard to actually decipher between them. And I think if we go on to your third pick, and uh, it's not necessarily something you've decided between, you've got Henry Shefflin and D.J. Carey on your Mount Rushmore. 
Uh, yeah, uh, my first one uh, was G.J. Carey. And Gary, I think, has summed it up brilliantly there. Um, you know, giving, giving a sportsman's eye, uh, a man from another sport, uh, you know, looking in to an extent from outside about what made G.J. so special. Uh, as Gary, Gary said, uh, well, Gary said it much better than I could, the way he carried himself, the way he would get a ball uh, and just go with it. Um one thing uh, that has always uh, kind of interested me about DJ is this. I don't think, uh, even above Henry, even above Tommy Welsh, I don't think any Kilkenny player has ever given more pleasure to Kilkenny fans than DJ Carey has. And I would say I don't think any hurler, uh, certainly in the modern era, has given more pleasure to fans outside his own county as DJ Carey has because DJ was you know, wildly popular with people from non-hurling counties uh, you know, who would just be watching on TV uh, just loved what DJ did. I mean, that Lake Regale programme a few years ago, uh, I had forgotten how many brilliant goals DJ had scored. Uh, there was never, I think, you know, most hurlers resemble kind of I won't say most hurlers resemble one another, but you can compare most hurlers to a hurler from the past. I mean, uh, Shefflin and Christy Ring, for instance, whereas with DJ Carey, I don't think there was any hurler like DJ in history. <clears throat> DJ was just uh, silly generous. Uh, there was only one DJ Carey, and as I said, he gave so much pleasure to so many people. I could have chosen Eddie Kerr, a hero of mine, mm. when I was younger, and Eddie Kerr would be a fantastic choice as well. Uh, but uh, I'm with Gary on this, uh, so DJ Carey. You could have also picked Brian Cody, and uh, this is going to be probably the most contentious of the decisions. Why did you leave him out? Uh, I tell you why I left him out. Uh, and it, look, it was going to be either Henry Shefflin or Brian Cody, okay. the most successful hurler or the most successful hurling manager. Uh, the reason I had to decide between them was they were both from the same era of Kilkenny hurling. Uh, and Kilkenny hurling did not begin in 1999. You had DJ, you had Eddie Kerr going back, you had Lowry Marr, Tommy, Tommy will be happy to hear me mention another Tullero man, Lowry Marr, the Prince of Hurlers back in the 30s. Uh, so to get, I think, to uh, give a broader representation. And again, if you're picking four hurling people or four horrors from Kilkenny, uh, Kilkenny Hurling, Mount Rushmore, of course Brian Cody is there just for the purposes of this exercise. I decided I had to choose between uh, Cody and Shefflin. Mm. Uh, and I mean, I would have perfectly been perfectly happy to have Willie Mullins in mind as well, and also to have Maeve Kyle, and also to have Doug C. Welch. But there could only be four, which brings me on to my final choice. And uh, Gary already mentioned him, Willie Duggan. Well, Gary, do you want to take uh, the baton here on, on uh, Willie Duggan? Because he's obviously in your Mount Rushmore as well. Can you talk to us about uh, the greatness of Duggan? Well, where he was, um, I've seen probably two, uh, two or three rugby players in my entire life that who, who, who I feel they were innate rugby players. And what I mean by that is they were so in tune with the game. It was almost they took a gift from birth. And Willie Duggan is one of those. For me, Zinzan Brook is the second one. And oddly, and surprisingly maybe for some, the third was Anthony Foley, uh, the late Anthony Foley. And Duggan just had this, he knew the game so well. Um, and people, you know, there was a lot of anecdotal stories about him, uh, but he was one of these guys in a rugby field, he knew the shortcuts on a rugby field more than anybody else. And, you know, he did amazing things close on the ball uh, when he was actually carrying. But some of his defensive work was just beyond belief. The way he knew, he anticipated the game two or three moves before everybody else. And when you see guys with, with those type of talents, you know, they're, they're very, very rare. But the, the thing about Duggan that I suppose few people uh, 
might know. As a younger person, he was actually a very good athlete. Willie Duggan, uh, in his day, high jumped over six foot two as a schoolboy. So he he was a very very good natural athlete as well. He was you know he was sizable. He had a, a, a he had a really uncompromising aggression. So he had he had so many good um, good uh, characteristics as a player. I mean, his, for such a big guy, and in the modern era with training, I mean, his hand skills were fantastic for a guy in that era as well. And he was just, he was, and he was a larger than life character. He, he was so many great things rolled up into one sporting personality. And he was, um, yeah, obviously, I, I, I remember him and know him, and, and know him very well, knew, knew him very well, with the Lord have mercy on him. And he was, He's just one of these characters we won't see again in rugby, and mm -hmm. uh, and for that reason alone, uh, you know he must get on. He must make the list. Definitely, I would fully agree with Enda this one. Right, I presume everything he's saying there, uh, you would echo that. And uh, what, what pushed him ahead of everybody else for this final spot for you? Um, one, one, as I was saying, was to kind of represent a broad church, to have a Catholic with a small C choice. Um, uh, one thing that uh, Gary, uh, it's so obvious that Gary didn't mention, uh, but uh, younger listeners may not be aware of this, Willie Duggan won a Triple Crown with Ireland in 1982. That was Ireland's first Triple Crown in 33 years. Uh, so he was not just a great rugby player with Ireland, he was a great rugby the winner with Ireland. Uh, Gary, uh, I'd like to hear Gary's opinion on this. Uh, we'll, uh, actually, I'll, I'll tell my Willie Duggan story first, then uh, I'll give Gary the hand pass. Uh, a couple of years ago, three or four years ago, last time I met Willie Duggan, I ran into him uh, uptown here in Kilkenny in High Street, and uh, we were across the street from a pub called the Paulson, Benji Lawyers. It's kind of Kilkenny's de facto rugby pub and I used to go in there a bit and it's great pub, Benji Lawler, great rugby guy, great Kilkenny man, great sportsman. Uh, anyway, uh, Duggan uh, said to me, well, how are you? I haven't seen you for a while. How are you doing? I said, grand, grand. And he kind of pointed over to Benji's. He said, uh, he's still going uh, for the old drink. And I said, uh, yeah, I am. And Duggan kind of looked at me and nodded sagely and said, well, look, as long as you're able to go for a pint every now and then, you're not going, you're not doing too badly. Now, I mean, there, there's a world of wisdom in that, isn't there? Uh, I, anyway, my hand pass for Gary is this. Uh, Duggan, you know, is associated with being a rugby player of his time. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, what does Gary think? Would Duggan have made it in the modern era? I think probably the reflex is to say that maybe he wouldn't have. But as Gary said, the guy was so fit, so athletic. And I mean, Duggan was a public, uh, you know, roister, but he was a secret trainer and a very fit guy. So Gary, uh, your opinion on the modern uh, Willie Duggan? I, without a shadow of a doubt, Willie Duggan would have made it in the modern era. The, the, two things alone. I, I just want to go back to, there's a very, very famous try that Ginger McLaughlin scored in Twickenham. And if you look at the running to play before that try scored, everybody remembers Ginger Dragon, the English pack over the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Willie Duggan touched the ball six times in that move into the immediate, into the immediate run into that try. And you know it was it, it was phenomenal to think he turned up in all those spaces. So he had this ability. He had fantastic hands. So he had, uh, I suppose, he had all the skill. But more importantly, in the in the professional era, you know what they have now with kids. You know they educate kids. So from you know you got to understand from a younger age he would have been mentored. And, it, you know, his career his career path would have been different. Mm -hmm. But in terms of pure ability, uh, he would have been, I, I have no doubt in my mind, he would have played. Some people would have argued to say that he might have played six or seven on the side of the scrum. But to me, he would have always been an eight. And most definitely, he would have made it in the modern era. There's no, you cannot replicate the type of talent that he has had. And, you know, and even looking at modern rugby players, um, in, in many respects, you could still argue he was a he was a better player than 
than them in, in, in relation, particularly to his hands and his ability to get passes away in a, in a, in, in tight position. So, mm. no, you know, I, I would say there, there's not a shadow of a doubt he, he, he would have made it today. Yeah, the, the candidate is clear. Uh, Willie Duggan is on the Mount Rushmore. You both agree on him, so by the rules of the game, he is definitely up there. Just a reminder of Enda's other three choices, DJ Carey, Henry Shefflin and Angela Downey have got his nods, but Gary, you can only make one change and your Mount Rushmore would have been Willie Duggan, Maeve Kyle, Willie Mullins and Duxie Walsh. So out of the three that aren't Willie Duggan there, who would be your strongest candidate to put up there, do you think? Uh, it, it, it is. So, so, well, there's enough. I mean, we've spoken about Willie Duggan for quite a bit. I mean, if you look at Willie, Mull Willie Mullins, mm. um, incidentally, just to get back to my hurl thing, I... At the end of my decisions last night, I, I, I needed a hurler in there. I went one for four, and um, I then I picked out two Willie Mullins. And if I had to, I would have replaced him with Brian Cody. Mm. That's just a sort of an also-ran comment I wanted to say. I think I wanted to say about Cody. Cody, when, I was, when he was managing, I was involved in rugby in those early years. And as rugby guys, we were intrigued with this fella because uh, I've never met Brian Cody. Brian Cody is one of those people who... You know, if I if I had the ability to, you know, invite four of the biggest sporting personalities to lunch to to have a chat with the Brian Cody would probably be first on my list, because he had this sort of, you know, that keeping cards close to the chest. But more than anything, time and time again, I heard this Brian Cody picks on your ability at training, how you're working in the here and now. Reputations meant nothing to him, and coming from a sport like rugby. That would have been a lament of mine years past because reputations did count. But to, to see somebody who picked on pure ability at that time, I thought was was commendable. But having said it, if I was to get back to the question to look at who would I replace, uh, uh, who, who would I substitute in to um, end as for? I mean, Willie Mullins, is, you know, his success rate mm. is just... I mean, I am not a huge horse racing fan. And like everybody else coming onto this show, I went away and I did my Wikipedia bit, you know. But I mean, the list, of, I mean, for pure success, it's just, you know, I, I'm blown away by it. He has 72 wins at Cheltenham. He has, I mean, he has um, countless Irish, uh, Irish wins. 10 gold cups, punches five, punches down gold cups, six champion hurdles. Countless numbers of wins in the UK as well. It's really, in my view, it would be very, very difficult to overlook Willie, Mull uh, Willie Mullins on any Mount Rushmore. Right. And he would be the character who I would be looking to bump onto Enda's list. Just, just before we get to, to that, Gary, in terms of who you're going to take off, just a, a quick word on Maeve Kyle and why she was on your list, if you were picking. Well, Maeve Kyle would have a special... You know, I, I, I had a previous career as a hammer thrower as well. Met, um, so I, I'm very close to the um, athletics would be very, very near and dear to me. But what Maeve Kyle did in that time, I think, is phenomenal. You know, you're talking about a lady who was born in 1928. So, you know, she was in her, in her prime in the 50s and in the 60s. Uh, I mean, she won, an Indy, she won a European indoor bronze um, in 1966. That's 54 years ago. Um, and she was a late. And she, she ran in the. She was at the um, the fifty, the fifty six and sixty Olympics. She ran the one and two hundred in Melbourne, and she ran the four and eight hundred, getting to the semi finals of the Olympic Games uh, in those years. Post her immediate, post her retirement as a as a track and field athlete, she had four individual Masters world records. She won countless Masters championships, and to top all that. She, she was initiated, uh, she got a Lifetime Services Award in 2017 from uh, Great Britain Athletics. Uh, she has 58 hockey caps for Ireland as well. We, you know, these are the 58 hockey caps and was one of the first uh, inductees into the, 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 hockey, the hockey Hall of Fame. So uh, she is, her achievement is phenomenal for a lady in those years. And um, that's why she made, that's why she made my, uh, my four. Um, the, the the other person who I who I had in my four was, was uh, Duxie Welsh, um, mm. and Duxie Welsh, the handballer, uh, uh, and we're we're about the same age. We were in primary school together, and again, Duxie for me, just for sheer accomplishment, 
Uh, I mean, 16 All-Ireland softball titles, several doubles titles, uh, seven titles on the, on the larger court. He was just an, un, an unrivaled champion uh, in handball. Uh, and, that's what, yeah, and that's why Duxie would have made mine. But if I am subbing in, I'd like to sub in Willie Mullins okay. uh, into Ender's group. Great. And before we take somebody off, uh, Enda, you also have an opportunity to, to listen to the very valid points that Gary is making. And you, you can alternate your Mount Rushmore if you wish, but are you sticking with your four? <laughs> I'm going to stick with my four, but believe me, my I have a B list. And this was my, <laughs> B, my, my B list was Brian Cody, Eddie Kerr, Willie Mullins and Duxy Welsh. Okay? Better than your A list. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it, it, it is, isn't it? And it could as easily have been my A-list. And uh, one thing just to add to what uh, Gary was saying about Willie Mullins to, there, uh, as well as being the king of Cheltenham, and I mean, Willie Mullins on the Friday of Cheltenham this year uh, sat the first four winners. Uh, very happily, I had the first three of them. It was a very good day. But um, uh, that wasn't the first uh, time he had done that. Uh, I think in 2017, on the Thursday of Cheltenham, he sat out four winners as well. I mean, that is just incredible stuff. One thing, and this has been mentioned once or twice, uh, ever since Michael O'Leary took away his horses out of the Mullins stable, Willie has broadened his ownership. He took good care to get a lot of new owners. Uh, so he wasn't as affected as he might have been by losing the Jigginstown horses uh, and he's just kept churning out the winners and also he has had winners, Raymond has had winners on the flat, Newmarket, the Cesaro Witch and Royal Ascot. Uh, a few years back he won the big uh, steeple chase in Japan, in Japan of all places. He sent Blackstar Mountain halfway around the world to win in Japan. The guy is just a genius. Uh, and uh, as I say, he was on my B list, Mount Rushmore. <laughs> so if uh, Gary wants to sub him in, fine by me. But Gary has to say, <laughs> who is he talking by Mount Rushmore? I'm sure Willie Mullins will be delighted to hear that he is on someone's B list uh, this morning. So uh, Ender's final list is Andrew. Angela Downey, Henry Shefflin, DJ Carey and Willie Duggan. Gary, you are switching in Willie Mullins. Who would you like to take off? Now, you see, I think, that, now, and, and this is no disrespect, but you've two hurlers in there. So my natural reaction is going to be to take out one of the hurlers. And um, I would, you know, just, you know, I, I can't, I, I, I'm going to take out Henry Shefflin. I can't believe I'm actually <laughs> saying this. Ah, come on, come <laughs> on. I have to take Shefflin off the list, and you know I could get lynched at Little Kenny for this, you know. Um, but uh, for me, just uh, you know, there is obviously um, just the sheer satisfaction of you know DJ Carey making huge impressions on me as I was watching games at the time. That's all that would swing it for me. The, the, you know, interestingly, I mean, the longevity of Shetland on top of his brilliance is something that, you know, I know we've said quite a lot about it, but that actual, the, the longevity aspect wasn't really mentioned. And that that in itself, I, I think you could say, puts them apart from other people. But I have this sort of, these great memories of watching DJ Carey play. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to take Henry Shefflin off the list and <laughs> put in Willie Mullins. I'm sorry, and I cannot believe what I'm hearing. On, I on your, on I'm your hearing. head, be it. But I am... <laughs> I have the f a feeling the two of us may be run out of town, <laughs> given that we don't have Henry Shefflin or Brian Cody on yeah. our uh, Rushmore. Yeah, it's sad. Well, this is worse than Waterford. I, I, <laughs> this this yeah, is the biggest I, controversy I, I, so far. Yeah, well, if I had a, had a, you know, I'm not going to go through a full B list, but uh, uh, as I said, when I, when I came here this morning, I had made up my mind I need a hurler on the list. And I'm being very sneaky but honest in doing that. Um, mm. I took my other three names out of a hat, and actually Willie Mullins' names came out of the hat. So if I had to nail my colours to the mass like you had to, so I had that, I, I had that, uh, uh, I had that pleasure of not having to do that. Cody would have been on my list definitely. Yeah. Well. He would have, but uh, unfortunately, that is uh, a hypothetical at the, uh, right now because <laughs> your final mountain is Angela Downey, DJ Carey, Willie Duggan, Willie Mullins. Very quickly, Enda, where will this mountain be carved out? Where in Kilkenny will it be located? 
Oh, uh, Kilkenny isn't very mountainy, mm. uh, I'm afraid. So uh, actually, maybe maybe highlight them, maybe engrave them into the facade or the back wall of Kilkenny Castle, something like that. And actually, they would be overlooking John's Bridge, which, as I was said, was built by Maeve Kyle's father. So that would be a kind of oblique nod to Maeve Kyle. So we, we get her in as well. There you go. Uh, Gary, you happy enough with that? Yeah, I'm happy enough with that. I think that's a that, that, that's a good choice. On the castle would be a good thing. Very good. Well, Little la- good spots at night, of course, you know. It was an unenviable task to try and uh, sift Kilkenny's sporting uh, heritage down to four names, but uh, you did a good job. There is going to be controversy, I'm not going to lie, but uh, you did a good job. Yeah, and, uh, and, and look, I, I know that collective responsibility usually applies, but in this case, it was Gary who left Henry Sheffield <laughs> off, okay? And I am going to be telling everyone that. Uh, Enda McAvoy, Gary Halpin, thanks a million for joining us. That is it for Kilkenny's Mount Rushmore.